Real quick, um, next week, uh, we will be starting our new sermon series, You Got Served. So uh, this uh, sermon series uh, coincides with our campaign here as the, um, the building and the developing of the culture in regards to our ability to reach one another as a church and uh, more importantly, reach uh, the community as well. Uh, this sermon series is about learning to release your gifts through love to meet the financial, practical, and emotional needs of the church and the community. Amen? Amen. But today, um, we are in part nine, our last sermon of this sermon series, Extraordinary. Um, we have went through now uh, the uh, bulk of Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one is a long chapter. Uh, we've had uh, 80 verses um, that are in the first chapter of Luke, but I pray that this sermon series has definitely been a blessing uh, for you, especially for those in whom have been attending the 242. It's the last week, 242, so <laughs> praise God for those in whom um, have uh, fought through uh, many nights of uh, certain challenges in order to get here. Um, I want to say thank you to the leadership um, for those in whom would um, really impart wisdom and impart shepherding, uh, you know, just at a, a very high uh, level um, here within this church. And I greatly um, appreciate that. So it's, it's awesome to see how it is that our church is really beginning to take ownership in regards to our own spiritual development. Amen. Amen. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter one, uh, verses uh, 57 uh, through 66. <clears throat> Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. Verse 63. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will, will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. The title of today's message is His Name is John. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this moment of transformation. Father, we thank you that any time that the word of God is being preached, we know there is spiritual warfare going on. So I would ask this day, O oh Lord, that you would assist, O oh God, in helping me to lay down the groundwork, Father, of preaching from a position, God, of humility, and wisdom, and concern. Father, what a blessing, O oh Lord, to share the gospel here this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 400 years. 400. Over 400 years prior to this moment, the prophet Malachi spoke and said in verses 5 through 6 in chapter 4, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before, everybody say before, before, the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with the decree of utter destruction. And the scroll was closed. The last prophetic utterance about the future prophet has taken root and is beginning to grow with every prophetic confirmation that we find in the first chapter of Luke. 
But now, ladies and gentlemen, the scene is set. The scene is set. The angelic annunciation of John and Jesus have connected the old with the new. The good news has went forth and everything is happening just as God said that it would happen. And here we are at the very moment of birth of the one in whom Jesus would later say, that among those born of women, none is greater than John. We begin, figuratively speaking, in the delivery room of John the Baptist. If you've had a child, can you remember the excitement? Can you? Or maybe you were afraid that that car seat that you installed wasn't going to work on the way home. That's one thing that they don't really talk about when there's a new child, that that first ride home is terrifying. You are on <laughs> the right-hand side of the road, and you're trying not to get on the highway. But do you remember the anxiety? Do you remember the uncertainties? These insecurities that would pop up? Like, am I going to be a good parent? Do I have what it really takes? Does God know what he's doing by allowing for me to be a parent? Now imagine these same thoughts in retirement. Imagine these same thoughts in retirement. That at the time in which you were slowing down, God is getting ready to wind you back up. But now imagine the lobby being full of Elizabeth's friends and relatives, amazed by how God has shown great mercy to the old and once barren Elizabeth. They rejoice with Elizabeth after she has given birth and now eight days later, the time has come to name the child and to circumcise the child as well. Can you imagine the anticipation? Years and years and years and years of the prayer just not being answered. The anticipation of this moment, this miracle child. Everyone is wondering. The people are chattering. They want to know the name of this miracle child. Now, it was customary, according to Leviticus chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, that on the eighth day after birth, the male son was to be circumcised. Unlike modern circumcision, which is mainly for health concerns for the child, the Jewish practice of male circumcision was an outward expression of faith that God has and will fulfill his promises. It was an everlasting reminder now to be placed upon the infant John and his body. Genesis 17 verse 11 says this. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. But naming the child was typically, not all the time, a responsibility of the father. However, in this account... The relatives and neighbors wanted to name the child after his father, Zachariah. But Elizabeth refused. And what did she say, church? His name would be John. But just like relatives, <laughs> to go to one spouse, and they didn't get the answer that they wanted, so they go to the other spouse. And now what we see is the conflict revealed. The tension. Because to the neighbors and relatives, Zechariah and Elizabeth were breaking away from tradition. Because typically a child would receive the name of one of his relatives. See, in biblical times, 
The naming of a child demonstrated parental authority over a child. However, in this case, in other parts of the Bible, God named the child. He's demonstrating that John will be under the authority of God in an extraordinary way for the rest of his life. Zechariah's miracle son is God's chosen instrument to prepare the way for Jesus. Holman's Bible Dictionary says to know the name of a person was to know that person's total character and nature. It revealed destiny and contained hope for the child's future. Now here we start really zooming in. So they asked Zechariah. And from his response, we can conclude that he was dumb, that he could not hear, and that he could not speak because they're making signs to him to write on this tablet. And they asked him, what will be the name? Husbands, take notice. He stood in agreement with God and his wife. It's almost like to say, I guess you didn't hear her. His name is John, the name that God has chosen for him. I couldn't get off of this all week. I couldn't. And we're really taking a bird's eye view on this text. Because this statement is a life-changing statement. Why? Because it is a life-changing act of obedience. Zachariah and Elizabeth's life would never be the same after this moment. But why? Well, God has taught us a very valuable lesson through Zechariah. That to obey God is to experience perfect freedom. To obey God is to experience perfect freedom. Zechariah had learned that surrendering to God is the way to live. Surrendering to God is the way to live. Zachariah got a second chance. Let's sit on that for a second. I want you to think about the last time that you failed God and what it cost you. The last time that you failed God and what it cost you. And now imagine that God has given you a second chance to get it right and glorify him. How would you feel? What would you do with that second chance? Because we have to remember what happened the first time to Zechariah. Zechariah was judged for his lack of faith. In Luke chapter 1, verse 8 through 23, it describes the account of Zechariah's unbelief. As Zechariah the priest served in the temple, the angel Gabriel appeared. And the angel delivered good news about Israel, Elizabeth, and John. But Zechariah doubted the fulfillment of the message of God. Why would a man whom Luke describes in chapter 1 verse 6 as, a, as righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, why would he doubt God's message? He's a priest. He's in the temple. He serves for a living. What would cause for him to doubt? Now let's zoom in here. 
When we begin to assume that God is inactive, it becomes a serious cause for us to doubt. When we begin to doubt, it begins to corrupt our ability to walk in obedience to God. Four hundred years. Everybody say four hundred. Not one week. Four hundred. What do you think this does to spiritual leaders who are serving every single day at the temple? Even though even the Ark of the Covenant's not even there. What does this do to individuals in whom they have not received anything? No prophetic utterance from God. You know what you begin to think? That God does forsake his people. Some of us only need a day to hop into that theology. I prayed. It didn't happen. God forsakes his people. Because if he loved me, he wouldn't allow for this to happen. Oh, I'm not going to go there right now. But similar to now, we can be highly traditional, very religious. We can quote scriptures with the best of them. We can sing songs, hymns. We can attend church regularly. We can serve people, but, and it's a huge but, Become non-transformational because every time you're tested, you doubt God and that he will fulfill his word. This don't matter. This doesn't matter if you are not looking to obey it. It will be a waste of your time if you are not looking to obey the word of God. You can keep coming to church. You can keep serving. You can hug people during connect time. You can c congratulate new members. You can give. But when you get tested because your faith has to be tested in order for it to be faith. And all of a sudden when we get tested. Well, I just don't believe he's going to fulfill the word. So I'll do my own thing. Why read if you're going to do your own thing? Why come to church if you're going to do your own thing? He was serving. He's in the presence of an angel. And God wasn't greater than what he was going through. See, when tested, what emerged were Zachariah's inadequacies, his deficiencies, and his inabilities. These real life adversities had become greater than God. And when they become greater than God, that's what I said, these are real life situations. What did he say? He says, I'm old, my, my wife is old, like we've been praying for this and I, I just don't, I don't see how this is going to happen. Theologian Warren Wearsby says it this way, faith is blessed, but unbelief is judged. Faith is blessed, but unbelief is judged. And Zechariah was struck dumb until the word was fulfilled. Now, let's fast forward. Now, God puts him to the test again. And his answer to the test is powerfully liberating. He writes, this time, his name is John. His name is John. There's a lot behind that. It's liberating when you let go. Now, I'll be one to tell you that when I sit down and my child, Gabby, wants me to watch videos with her, I will turn it on, but I'm going to sleep. Just don't tell her that I'm going to sleep. And she's always got the, oh, and she brought up this movie, Sing. How many of you guys have seen that movie, Sing? Right? You got like, yeah, I didn't think that at all. It was all right. It wasn't like, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that. No. 
Now, I didn't watch the whole movie. <laughs> but the part that I did watch, there was an individual that I focused on, and it was the elephant. The elephant had pipes. She could sing, but she wouldn't let go. And they kept telling her, let go, let go. And when she finally did, it blew everybody away. I don't watch The View, but there was a moment on The View that the women were just like, we're going to be real. We're going to be free today. This is a clip. I told you, I don't watch The View. And women start taking out their hair extensions. Now, I love you. Don't do that here. <laughs> Love will be tested in that moment. Because people start, I'm taking on, and they start taking teeth off on it. Whoa, TMI, right, you know? But they started taking out the hair extensions. And all of a sudden, the crowd was roaring because it was freeing to them. And they were looking at this other lady, African-American lady, what's her name? Whoopi? Not Whoopi. It was, an, it was another one that day. Okay, one, one of the black funny people. So anyway, so she's sitting there. She's like, I'm not, mm -mm. not happening, not happening. And they were like, yeah, come on now. Everybody else taking off like these little extensions. And they like, no. And I saw them doing like this, like take it off. And she's like, nope. You guys got hyped up by this crowd. Nope. And then all of a sudden. She pulled back and took the wig off. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. It's a lot of love that day on the set. <laughs> but there's something to be said when you let go and it becomes the most freeing, liberating act that you will ever have in your life. You know what letting go looks like? We went to the Henley's wedding. And you guys are losing your mind. And of all the kids that are out there, it's all the leaders' kids that are out there just, like I'm looking like, man, like I don't dance at home. So it must be my wife. So anyway. <laughs> But you know what's interesting? And I speak to all the wall sitters. Man, I want to get out there, but I just don't have the courage to do it. There's some of you who were talking with me. You know who you are. You were wall sitting just like me. But didn't it look like when everybody was hitting that dance floor, that was freeing? And Josh got up there. Josh got some Michael Jackson in him. He was going here. And I was like... <laughs> Whoa. And then Kendrick started. Ah, 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 ah. Now I'm not gonna lie, I was sitting back there like trying to steal a move. He owned that foot, right? His name is John. Do you get it now? Powerfully liberating. Transformative. Why? Because he understood perfect, perfect freedom can only be experienced when you obey God. A second chance doesn't mean anything if you haven't learned from the first one. Zachariah and Elizabeth, they wouldn't allow for anything or anyone to interfere with what God was doing through their family. They stood together. They faced pressure from the community, relatives and neighbors. And he and his wife refused to stand in agreement with the community. And together they stood together. Together they stood together. I don't know if that made sense, but I'm going to roll with it. And they said, we're going to name him the name that God has given him. I mean, 
if this is my one and only child, he's going to be Will Jr. He's going to be Will Jr. Maybe. I, I got rid of Will. You know, we had some bad Wills in the family. So I'm going to <laughs> Lucas, you are the light. <laughs> But there's something in that name because there's legacy in that name. To obey God is to experience perfect freedom. And then at this moment, let's keep walking through this. Then at this moment, the Bible says that Zechariah's mouth is open, that his tongue is loosed and he blessed God. Does this remind you of anything in Matthew 12, 34 from the abundance of the heart? The mouth speaks. He's overflowing. For the first time in nine months, his mouth is open. His tongue is loosed. And with his first words, he praises God. Would you? Nine months? Especially after I would, you know, remember, Mary came to the house, correct? I'd be, I'd be doing some kind of like, what did you say to the angel? You know, you are, you're not quiet. You mean if I'd have switched a couple of verbs and nouns, I would. I can't wait for these nine months to be over with because I'm going to tell God exactly what's on my mind. See, when he opens his mouth in this sense, he has regained his ability to utilize his mouth openly and unobstructed. I've heard it said, And when we lose our ability to use one of our senses, that our other senses are heightened. I'm going to show you this video. And I want to put some context to it. I want to go back to losing an ability of one of our senses heightens the others. Um, There was a magician. His name is Darren Brown. Darren Brown did this experiment. And this experiment was on a Caucasian male who hated any man or woman of color. He was on video. I I, like I hated they need to get out of the country. Very racist. And they did an experiment with him. Now this was just one of the things that they did. They sat him down and there was a Hispanic man right in front of him. And he had to sit there quiet for four minutes, for four minutes. Roll the video, please. The experiment was developed by a New York psychology professor to provoke feelings of empathy. When this man was silent, just for four minutes, we can get off of there, you can go to that next slide. Thank you. When this man was silent for Four minutes, his senses were heightened. His senses were heightened when he was silent just for four minutes. You know what was happening? He was listening for the first time. He was still and he was quiet. He saw for the first time a man, a culture, a race in which he hated. But did you pay attention to what he said in the video? The longer he looked at him, the more that he wanted to give him a hug. He said it was overwhelming. Similar to this man, the more that Zachariah looked at God for nine months without saying anything, God became greater. God became greater. And the first thing he did when given the opportunity was to express his love by praising God. We see a man four minutes 
you think about nine months and how you begin to focus upon God with nine months of just pure silence. And he came out of it and God was great. God was great. Fear and wonder came upon all their neighbors and the word spread about the things in which had occurred. Luke records that all who heard laid up all they had witnessed. That means this moment impacted them greatly. The people were literally letting everything that they had seen and heard sink in to their hearts because they wanted to remember how it is that God's hand is powerfully at work. The community is witnessing the hand of the Lord. They are witnesses to the power of God. God's presence was with his family. When God's people submit, the world takes notice. When God's people submit, the world takes notice. See, when we finally submit, God gets the glory. And we are blessed. Amen? Amen. When we surrender, similar to the community <clears throat> around Zechariah and Elizabeth, those around us will be amazed and intrigued because courage is contagious. The correlation between courage and submission are extremely important. Why? It takes courage to submit to God. It takes courage to say no to the obvious things in your life. It takes strength to forego your intuition. It takes trust to forsake your understanding. It takes humility to empty yourself. And it takes guts, guts to live for the glory of God. It takes guts to live for the glory of God. Because sooner or later, God is going to come asking for that in which you are a steward of. And when you obey, God is glorified and the world changes. But as long as we keep second guessing God while he's giving us second and third chances, you will stay in this position of being stagnant with your faith. You will grow old. You will love God. But you will miss out on the moments of transformative power in your life. Oswald Chambers says the best measure of your spiritual life is not your ecstasies, but your obedience. Not your ecstasies, but your obedience. Now, in his retirement age, Zechariah is alive with a greater measure of spiritual power. Have you noticed what just happened? Zechariah has been transformed from a priest to a prophet. The theme of God's mercy continues through Zechariah's prophecy as the Holy Spirit fills him to speak the oracles of God with accuracy. Let me just address one thing in regards to prophecy. I'm just going to hit it real quick. If it's not true, you're not a prophet. Like, if it's not true, if it is not unto the glory of God, stop it. I'm looking, stop it. Quit calling yourself prophet whoever. My mother called me the other day. She was like, all these people call themselves prophet. I said, well, if they're going to do that, then let's live by the word of God. That when you do not adhere and you are not truly obeying God and you want to let it out that thus saith the Lord, I need to get my rock ready. I need to get my rock ready. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, read it. Why do you think they kept wanting to stone Jesus? Because of who he proclaimed to be. And they would say, this man is this, this man is that. But let me tell you this. He's prophesying. And all these things have come to pass. Accuracy. That was my little, now I'm back. If you got the gift... 
You better walk with it with humility. You better be careful with what you say. 67 through 80. And he says, And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us, that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Verse 76. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Verse 80. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. After 400 years of prophetic silence, God is fulfilling his covenant with Israel. And through Israel, Christ will redeem everyone who believes. Blessed be our God, our Savior, who is faithful to his promises. He does not, folks, forget his people. The deliverer, folks, is on his way. And John is preparing the way by proclaiming the knowledge of salvation through Jesus Christ as he comes to take away the sins of the world and free those in spiritual and in moral darkness. Before we were made alive together in Christ, we were what? Dead in our trespasses. We were dead, meaning that there was no light and there was no life. We were dead. We could not hear. We were dead. We could not resurrect ourselves. We were dead, which means that we were only acquainted with darkness. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus Christ provides light to those in darkness. Jesus will guide the feet of those in the shadow of death towards everlasting peace. Jesus is the only one who can deliver us. God is continuing the fulfillment of his plan to redeem mankind through Jesus Christ. For if the prophecies dating back to the beginning of Genesis have come to fruition, and we can trust the scriptures, and we can trust that Christ will return, and that God is still at work blessing his Children, Do you believe that, church? Because when God says that he's going to do something, he does it. He does it. Be encouraged. Because God has not forgotten you. Be encouraged. Because God is still performing miracles. Be encouraged that... Because God's silence doesn't equal condemnation nor neglect. Be encouraged because God will fill you to fulfill his will. And be encouraged that God will deliver you from wherever it is that you are at. Remember the importance of Zachariah's statement. His name is John, what is the one thing that you need to lay at Christ's feet in obedient submission to experience perfect freedom? Because that is what God is after today. Let us pray.